All right, so let's look at this book today. It's Foundations of Quantum Mechanics by Travis Norson. Um, and this is, well, it's a book by a physicist at, I think, a uh, liberal arts college um, that goes into the foundations of quantum mechanics, right? And, you know, it's this the foundations of quantum mechanics is something that we get into a lot in the podcast. The foundations of quantum mechanics is something that, you know, we just talked a lot about in a conference I just went to. So it's something I've been thinking about a little bit. And here's a book that I read about it a few years ago. Uh, this is definitely, it's kind of sad because, you know, notes were saying that's after maybe 2013, the way I did notes this way. Uh, very thin for the notes, but um, a lot of these things you'll see in other books. So if you got the Quantum Paradoxes book, you read that. A lot of the things that are in this book are in that book. And uh, I'm a little scared. I think some of the figures are exactly the same. Some are much, much different. So this is really centered towards undergraduates who've had an um, experience with physics or experience with uh, modern physics at some point. Uh, you can see just by opening it up, I end up with Maxwell's equations in a section entitled ontology, <laughs> right? So um, that's something interesting. So this is about the foundations of quantum mechanics. Now, what are the foundations of quantum mechanics? These are sort of the ideas, almost metaphysical ideas, maybe even exactly metaphysical ideas because I've never really understood the term that well, that talk about, you know, what you need to understand to start doing quantum mechanics, start understanding quantum mechanics. What are the um, basic tenets of quantum mechanics? Von Neumann sort of things. All right. So again, from Springer's undergraduate lecture notes on physics, a good series, uh, very long series, many, many series. Um, don't try to collect all of them, all those books. Um, this book does spend a lot of time with interpretations of quantum mechanics, and people do. I mean, it is strange. People do spend a lot of time talking about those interpretations. Okay, so as usual, we go through the contents, and first we'll talk about uh, pre-quantum theories, um, Newtonian mechanics. So you'll so you'll notice that physicists start physics with Newtonian mechanics uh, with Newton. Uh, Maxwellian electrodynamics a couple hundred years later. Then he starts talking about things like locality and we get into Bell's formation, formulation of locality right away. We talk about those um, ontology things, um, the things that you have to have in your theory. That, what are the different theory, things in your theory? What makes up the objects of your theory? What are you talking about in your theory? Uh, measurement, this is the big problem, the measurement problem and abstract spaces. And that's something you really have to worry about in quantum mechanics, because usually we're talking about something like a state space. And our basis vectors in quantum mechanics are different states. They're not different directions, necessarily. They could be, but usually they're different positions or different things like that. So there are lots of different things that go into those um, spaces. Um, then we go into examples. What are the sorts of things that are quantum mechanical? The particle in a box. Remember, these students that have seen this have probably seen a normal first year quantum mechanics or, you know, junior level, maybe just a modern physics class. But those are um, going to go into that particle in the box. It's a really easy, it's about as easy as you can get as soon as you've done a little bit of um, differential equations. That's basically the first thing they talk, talk to you about. Because um, it's basically, it's really a very simple problem that you've seen over and over and over again with wave equations. Um, the free particle in a Gaussian wave packet. Um, so these guys here are just things that you notice. Um, diffraction and interference and spin and several particles. So diffraction and interference, uh, that's pretty um, common. So let's take a peek at that, if I see. So actually gives some nice um, descriptions. This is a, you'd say it's a full color book, but I mean, the color just shows up every once in a while. So I'm not sure 
how often it does and how much well this isn't uh 1950s so they don't have to spend a lot a lot on plates and stuff like that for the color images so um you don't have as much difficulty printing but i'm not sure exactly how much that costs them that's interesting um then we get into the measurement problem that's the first big issue with um, quantum mechanics is what does measurement mean right and so having something directed like this on the measurement problem one whole chapter on the measurement problem um, one chapter out of ten so this is let's say this is a uh, um, quarter long course that's a week is the measurement problem and you know you're talking about Einstein, Schrodinger's cat and Einstein's bomb I think that's the Moxinder interferometer I'm not sure um, no that's not the Moxinder interferometer that's something else actually but you know you're getting in here trying to d figure out what it actually means to measure something because measurements in quantum mechanics are hugely important and so you want to understand the meaning of that and we don't really understand the meaning of that we have some kinds of interpretations to go along with that and we'll get to that at the end of the book but we don't really know what happens so we have this Schrodinger equation thing it leads to uh, this dynamics this wave these wave functions um, we have this wave equation the Schrodinger equation that gives us things like particles in the box um, the Gaussian wave packet diffraction interference those all come from that Schrodinger equation um, but when you try to measure something then you have a problem and um, you know you can do a formal treatment something like a von Neumann treatment and you can try to figure out what's going on behind it you know are there hidden variables out there or not and you know those are the sorts of ideas that you start with right then comes to another problem with quantum mechanics that people need to understand and don't really understand again I was at a conference just last week very important they were talking about EPR EPR experiments EPRB experiments Einstein Podolsky Rosen Bell experiments and that's all in that uh, locality problem that's basically saying that um, classical statistics do not apply right and that's why we end up with this locality problem that we're worried about there Bohm's retelling or Bohm's reformulation and Bell's retelling and Bell was able to reformulate that or take Bohm's reformulation and rework that to get to a point where you could actually make a measurement and you could find out that there's a problem um, now the problem isn't necessarily that things are non-local but if you give up the locality problem or the loc locality stuff then what happens then you run out of then you have to contradict some other thing in the um, retelling and really the only viable one for that is causality so you have to talk about locality and causality and you have to define them for anything like that to make any sort of sense um then we have the ontology problem um you know what's actually in this thing what is that stupid wave function to begin with right what are we really measuring what, what are these things right we want to know what they are so the first five we go through those things now we get into um interpretations there's four interpretations in the last five chapters Right. The first one's the Copenhagen, Copenhagen interpretation. And that's really just a, a sort of shut up and calculate kind of idea. Uh, we can't really say anything about what's happening in the evolution. We just can talk about the measurements and stuff like that. It's a very um, positivist formulation, as in logical positivist, if you're familiar with philosophy. Then we have a pilot wave theory. Uh, this is basically from Bohm and de Broglie as well um, and in this case we break up the two parts of the measurement or the two parts of quantum mechanics the um, wave and the measurement and put them into basically two different things 
So we say we have this wave function that we measure, and when we measure an object in a pos particular position, we're saying that the wave function is one thing, and then the object's another thing that's bouncing around, let's say, on that wave function. Maybe, maybe not, right? Um, <clears throat> this is particularly, this is particularly um, popular among philosophers. I didn't think it was that popular among physicists. Uh, if I'm looking at the people in um, quantum foundations, though, if I'm looking at the people that are doing things, you know, with uh, the basics, the basic ideas of things, it's not actually, it's actually something that they care a lot about. And some people say that from their more complicated formulations of other things, they derive the pilot wave theory. I'm not sure about that, but... I'd have to read the papers and then actually understand them. Then we get to Bell's theorem, um, and that includes the CH, SH inequality. Uh, this thing is the thing I was talking about with the statistics, right? And this is a whole chapter on that, and it's very important. People talk about it all the time. Um, and it gets sort of short shrift in your standard quantum mechanics class. but when people are trying to understand quantum mechanics, Bell's theorem, that's the thing they're looking at. Then we have a spontaneous collapse theory, uh, GRW. It, you, usually people talk about it as GRW, not spontaneous collapse. Uh, basically that means your wave function is wandering around and then every once in a while it makes a measurement of itself and then it goes around for a little while longer and so forth and so on. So you notice empirical tests nice to see that. Most of these don't have them. The interpretations don't tend to have those sorts of things. And then we have a many worlds theory and that one is uh, popular with other people. Uh, this this guy has a big problem which is that it doesn't actually explain anything it's supposed to explain. <laughs> so not only does it have some most of the other problems, right, like if you look at the pilot wave theory, you have a problem, right? Here, you're saying, well, how can I tell what is this pilot wave, this thing that's guiding your particle, and the particle, how can I tell that? How can I make a measurement of that pilot wave by itself on its own? The answer is you can't. And that makes it a little less than scientific. But you get that same problem here in many worlds, right? So how can I make a measurement of another universe. I'm, we've got many worlds. How can I look at that other world, right? Just one. I just need one of those other worlds. Then we can start talking about the other things. But once you get one, once you figure out how to do one, people will do as many as they can. Um, so that's an issue. But you have a problem. You don't, you know, this is sort of giving you an interpretation of probability. Many worlds, the many worlds interpretation came from an interpretation of probability. Um, the book I got that from, uh, actually I can reach it, I didn't think I was going to be able to reach it, is this guy, The Emergence of Probability by Ian Hacking, very nice book. Um, so when people first started talking about probability, when they figured out stuff about probability, which was amazingly late, right, this is like 18th century stuff when they're figuring this out. Um, you know, just the basics, like if you roll two dice, the average is seven. <laughs> you know, that stuff took people a long time to figure that out. Um, they had this many worlds idea that every time you rolled the dice, well, there'd be one universe where you rolled seven, one universe where you ran, rolled 11, one where you rolled two. It's all a problem, right? It's very difficult to... Um, interpret what that means. We've come to something a little better, but not that much better. I mean, there are some other things. So, so that's still an issue. We don't have a good idea about the probability. We don't even have a really good idea about what it means to make a measurement with this many worlds theory. So it doesn't really solve the problems that it sets out to solve, and that's sort of a big issue, but it's still fairly popular. So I showed you some things here. 
uh, like the full color plates, or maybe the and the or the full color uh, drawings. Here's some other ones. Here are uh, trajectories. These are weak measurements. Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure. These might be. Um, this type of image. Okay, so this I think is just a calculation. All right, so um, these are sort of the idea about what would the trajectories be in a pilot wave, right? And this shows you how you end up getting a double slit experiment, the interference with that pilot wave theory by seeing what happens to each one of these blue lines, right, is a trajectory for the quantum particle. And you can see that most of them just sort of radiate normally, and then every once in a while they jump from one of these directions to another. So you end up with uh, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark as your um, pattern on your screen for your interference experiment. Um, the weird thing about this is that if you look at weak measurements, this is exactly what the weak measurement guys give you. They'll measure something like this. Now, there are a few interpretation problems with that, but at least as far as where things are, how it, how it works out, where the um, particles go, this is a perfect description of where the particles go in the double slit experiment. So you have a few places. There was one other place I was looking at that had a good color plate. That's not so much of a good color plate, but it's sort of showing you what's happening with that GRW spontaneous collapse theory. And there's your multiple worlds right there, um, sort of branching off, doing their own things. Uh, I didn't find the other one. So that's, that's okay. I don't need to find all of them. You know, you can, if you're really interested in these sorts of color images, you can pick it up yourself. Um, and then the interesting thing here was, oh, look, there's a Wikipedia problem. Um, so now you don't know if that's actually true, right? Uh, <laughs> but because um, when was this published? Uh, it was published in 2017, so it's had four years to change, right? Their mind. But rather than having problems, this has projects, right? Uh, so read Bohr's Como lecture and report in any aspects you find surprising, interesting, novel, or illuminating. So these are many things that you can do. They're not really um, the kinds of problems that you get in other books. So if you were to compare this book with the uh, Quantum Paradoxes book we talked about a couple weeks ago, um, this, at least as far as what it asks you to do, is a lot less technical. It was written by a physicist. Uh, but it's at a small liberal arts college, and he does say that this is perfectly good for a philosophy of science course. So, at least, you know, in his um, introduction, in his foreword. So, I don't remember which one. So, it's a um, very nice, probably forward. It's a very nice um, book for that sort of thing. Um, it includes a lot of the paradoxes from quantum paradoxes. But it's not all paradoxes, like quantum paradoxes. So it's a very interesting book. Or it's a, it would be a complimentary book if you were really interested in getting into all these things. Um, rather than being so interested in the quantum mechanics problems itself and different ways to solve it, you're not, you're not going to read about modular variables in this book. Uh, instead, it talks about things not in a qualitative manner, but, you know, in a semi-quantitative manner. And, you know, it, it's not trying to get you to figure out how to do problems in the text. It's trying to get you to think about what you're doing. So this is a very good book for that. And as you saw, rather than looking at these aspects uh, one by one, um, as 
a different kind of quantitative difficulty, which I don't really think that's what quantum paradoxes did, but if you were to take a class on that, probably you'd end up only remembering the math. I'd, I'd say there's, there's an issue there. Um, but what it does is it goes through and it hits the three big things in the foundation of quantum mechanics. And as you think about those, through each one of the different um, interpretations of quantum mechanics. So with four different interpretations of quantum mechanics, um, and with that Bell's theorem stuff in sandwich in between them, um, just to give you more on that locality. So I think this is really good if what you're interested in is the foundations of quantum mechanics and maybe you're not quite so mathematically adept as you'd have to be with quantum paradoxes. Remember with quantum paradoxes we ran into a problem where the math was a little bit too heavy for the um, podcast format. So we were spending a lot of time talking about the math and not about the physics because of that. So. Again, this is a book I recommend something like this. I don't, I haven't read enough books on foundations of quantum mechanics to say that it's the best, but I will say that it is a clear ex explanation. It's a good, clear way to go through this. It has the right idea for somebody who wants to learn about those foundations of quantum mechanics. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, and I will get to you next week with another book. Bye now.